Eyes for Allah, nothing but Allah. Ba is the beginning of Bismillah. Ta is for taqwa, bewaring of Allah. And tha is for thawab, a reward. Ja is for Jannah, the garden of paradise. Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage. Kha is for Khatam, the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil'alameen Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Amma ba'd Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this new episode of Ask Huda, coming to you live from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Um Abdullah says, What can you advise a husband who always talks about divorcing his wife for little things, even when they have small arguments? He always threatens the wife with divorce. I can only advise this husband by reminding him of Allah Azza wa Jal. Divorce is a huge thing and it's a dangerous thing to be used not in its place. Allah Azza wa Jal, when he talks about marriage he describes it as mithaqan ghalifa. It is a thick and heavy bondage. So when one marries a woman, it's not something to be taken lightly. Not only this, divorce is something to be taken seriously because the Prophet told us والسلام, when someone divorces his wife, whether serious or jokingly, then the divorce takes place. So many people call in and say I was drinking tea with my wife and I was just playing around and I said you're divorced what's the ruling the ruling she is divorced he says I was joking there's nothing to joke about Allah Azza wa Jal says in chapter 2 surah al-Baqarah wala tattakhidhu ayatillahi huzuwa do not take the verses of Allah, the law of Allah as jest and to play and mock with it. And the scholars of tafsir say that it's like when a person says to his wife, I divorce you, and then he says, I reconcile. And after a while, I divorce you, and then he says, I reconcile again. This is playing around with Allah's uh, uh, religion and Allah's verses and this is totally prohibited so this person must fear Allah Azza wa Jal for what he's doing is a serious offense secondly it shows that he's not a man not a real man because Allah gave divorce to the man so that he is more in control when to use it and when not to use it because Supposedly, a man is a man by his manners and behavior. Being impulsive, everyone can be impulsive. If you're not man enough to communicate with your wife, and whenever you feel you are losing an argument, you say, if you don't stop talking, you're divorced. If you s insist on going to your mom's house, you're divorced. I will divorce you. I, I don't like the way you cook. I will divorce you. And he keeps on repeating this throughout the day this no, is not a real man seriously let's be frank this guy needs coaching because using this form of threatening and intimidation shows that he has zero communication skills he's unable to convince he's unable to incubate the problems in his home and try to deliver a solution Running away from the solution, from the problems, would never ever solve them. So may Allah Azza wa Jal guide him to the straight path. Abu Abdurrahman from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Um, Sheikh, I have a question. If, if uh, I may be attending a conference uh, in China, and uh, the conference is for two days, and the first day was on a Friday, and this will be my first time going over there, and uh, the language, of course, is a barrier, and I'm not sure about uh, Juma prayer, what to do, if it's difficult to find a place to pray Juma, or even if I should be uh, trying to leave the, uh, it's like a training uh, class, if I should be leaving the class, going to Juma and coming back, are we allowed to miss Juma in a circumstance like this? Okay, any more questions? Uh, that will be it, inshallah, Zakallah. What is that? Well, Abu Abdurrahman, basically speaking, if you are in a town or in a city where there are Muslims and Juma is being conducted there, it is highly recommended, if not mandatory, for you to attend. Now, we all know that Juma or Friday prayer, there are categories who are exempt from attending it. And the Prophet told us that the traveler, a woman, uh, a slave, a child, these are exempt from attending the Jum'ah. However, you are not on the road, though you are traveling. So my recommendation would be, if there is, uh, 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 within the vicinity where you are staying or having this conference, there is a masjid, then it would not take more than 40 minutes max for you to attend, and usually it's on lunch break. So you can attend. But if you need to drive or to take a car and travel away from the place you are, I believe, inshallah, this is an exception that you may take and you don't have to attend the Jum'ah, and Allah Azza wa knows best. Uh, the second question, uh, question is about a sister from the U.S. who's asking about a woman activist called so-and-so who says that hijab is not compulsory in these times and that hijab is actually cultural. It was for those times of the Prophet ﷺ and not these days. And she wants to know about the woman's right concerning the hadith about when a man calls his wife. Okay, these are two different questions. So the first question, a woman activist in the USA is talking rubbish and nonsense. So what does this have to do with us? This is a problem when we get such, with all due respect, nonsense from countries like the US pertaining Islam from people who are not qualified to talk about Islam. Alhamdulillah, we have scholars of Islam, people who had spent their entire life studying Islamic sciences. I'm not talking about students of knowledge or da'is. Or, I'm talking about real scholars who are acknowledged as scholars. Don't look at someone like me giving a seminar here or a workshop here and he's considered to be a scholar. This is nonsense. Scholars are those who are well versed essentially in Arabic, in Quran and its tafsir and its sciences, in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, in knowing what was abrogated and what was not, in knowing usul al-fiqh, in knowing the fiqh itself and the different fatwas of scholars so that they can apply all of this and they are acknowledged by other scholars to be scholars. So this individual, a sister, coming after 15 centuries of Islam, after the consensus of all Muslims that hijab is mandatory upon women, and she just sits there drinking her, her, her latte, probably, and says hijab is a cultural thing. And you're wasting our time asking us such a question to refute it? This is pathetic. This is baseless. And this woman, with all yani, due respect to where she's coming from, has no knowledge of Islam. This is why Muhammad ibn Sirin, may Allah have mercy uh, on his soul, the son-in-law of Abu Huraira and one of the great tabi'een said that this religion or this knowledge that you acquire and learn 
This knowledge is deen. It is religion. So observe and scrutinize who you are taking your religion from. It's not sufficient to open YouTube and watch a clip of XYZ saying any rubbish on his mind. It's not acceptable for you to listen to Tom, Dick, or Harry writing an article and being articulate and saying so many things that you don't have knowledge of but because of his convincing way, you think that he's a scholar. There are so many deviant sects around you. There are the super Sufis. There are those who are Rafida. There are those who are secularists and liberal. Those who are actually, these are the modern names. The actual real names is hypocrites who undermine Islam through what they say. So they come to you and they throw and cast doubts over your religion and at the end of the day you come and ask such a question. Now if someone tells you that well this was at the time of the Prophet but there are probably more than one God. What will you do? If someone comes to you and says well Salat is not five it should be three because of this and because of that. The Quran itself they can do whatever they want as long as those listening to them are ignorant. If you don't possess certainty and conviction in your religion, if you don't have the means of referring to the scholars and asking them, you will be like a feather in the wind, taking you left, right, and center. And this should not be. Know who you take your religion from. The USA is a great country. There are a lot of good students of knowledge that I know of, mashallah, and they're doing a lot of good work. But there are also some phony uh, students of knowledge. They may charge per a seminar or per a lecture $20,000 plus tickets, plus it's a business to them. So may Allah <laughs> make it easy for them, but for you to acquire your knowledge, you don't acquire your knowledge from this uh, 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 lady who claims that the hijab is something that is old, subhanAllah, as if Allah did not know that it was limited to time. Allah's religion is not limited to time. Tomorrow, someone will come and say, listen, drinking wine at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was haram because people did not have any locks on their doors and they could get you know, like wasted and kill people or rape others. Now, alhamdulillah, we have locks and we can control ourselves. We're social drinkers. We just have a, a glass or two just to be in the mood and nothing happens. So it's halal. These people want to change your religion. So I hope that answers your questions. Her second question uh, is about women rights. And women rights are given to them by Islam. If a woman from the US or from Canada or from UK comes and says that I am an advocate of women's rights, we say, before you continue and proceed, what rights are you talking about? There's the rights of equality, rights of this and rights of that. Listen, we have as Muslims rights given to the men and we have rights given to the women. We don't need your human so-called rights or women rights. This is not part of our religion. So definitely I would not look into such allegations. Now regarding the right of a husband that whenever he calls his wife to uh, uh, intimacy or to bed, she has to respond even if she was doing whatever she was occupied in doing. This is the right given to the husband. And the essence of marriage is to fulfill each one's desires. And we know that man goes out and is exposed to so many tribulations, trials, tests, and he sees a lot of things, unlike the woman who is concealed in her home, 
He sees a lot of things that may uh, uh, provoke his desire and lust. So whenever he calls his wife, it is her obligation to respond unless there is a legitimate reason for her to refrain. If she's sick, if she's uh, on her monthly period, etc., yes, this is acceptable. Other than that, this is God's given right to the husband. It has nothing to do with women's right because the man comes and says, where is my rights if I have to work like a dog and support my wife who is sitting there doing nothing 24-7? I feed her, I clothe her, I give her shelter, I do everything for her. Where are my rights? She says, we, Allah gave her rights and gave you rights as well and we should not mix apples with oranges. So I hope this also answers your question. Ahmed from Sweden. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. Uh, Shaykh, please can I ask uh, about, uh, can I have agreement from Sharia to working in the uh, security company in uh, European country? Doing what? Uh, like uh, police or like uh, security or something like that. Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Any more questions? Jazakallah. Uh, Brother Ahmed from Sweden is asking about a question, and that is, what's the ruling on working for security agencies in non-Muslim countries? We have to look into the actual activities of that entity that you want to work for. So if you tell me I'd like to work for the police department and I'll ask you what is your job description. See, I'm a, tra I'm a uh, uh, traffic policeman. So I investigate into accidents, road accidents. I implement that the regulations of driving is being uh, uh, followed and adhered to. I give fines. I do this. I do that. This is halal. There's nothing, nothing wrong in that. Yes, Sheikh, but I'm wearing the uniform of a Kafir, company, a, a Kafir country. No problem. Your work is halal, and it's th for the welfare of the whole community. He says, okay, then I work in narcotics. What do you do, Akhi Ahmed, in narcotics? He said, I bust gangs that sell uh, heroin and um, intoxicants in general, etc., and we uh, take them to jail, we uh, prevent such evil from being sold. This is a good job to do. There's no problem with that. If he says, I'm working for the army or the, for, for the air force, I said, hmm, let us look now. What do you do? He said, well, whenever is needed, we fight against other countries. Maybe we have to raid Afghanistan or Iraq or bomb the Mujahideen in Syria. It's, oh, whoa, whoa. No, this is totally unaccepted. Be even cooperating with them is not permissible. So this is wrong. But other activities, depending on your job description, as long as there is benefit for the community and there's no harm for the Muslims, there's no, nothing haram being committed, inshallah, this is permissible. Falak from uh, Saudi. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you? I am fine, Zakallah Khair, for asking. What can I do for you, Falak? I have one question. Yes. Is drinking water early morning on empty stomach sooner? Okay. Any more question? No, Sheikh. Jazakum Allah Khair. Wa jazakum. So, Falak's question usually comes in two ways. Is drinking water on an empty stomach part of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, part of the way, is it recommended? And the other part is, is there any prohibition in Islam on doing this? The answer for both is no. There is no recommendation on drinking water on an empty stomach, nor there is a prohibition on drinking it on an empty stomach. 
it is something up to your preference. If you want to do it, alhamdulillah. If you want to start your day with orange juice, it's up to you. If you want to go in straight to your breakfast, this is totally up to you. Maybe if you consult physicians and doctors and they tell you that it is healthier to drink a liter of water on an empty stomach because it does this and that to your body and this is or this was proven by scientific researchers from uh, uh, reputable academic institutions in this case you may follow this and you may not it's up to you but whether it is recommended Islamically or not halal or haram there's nothing to support this and Allah Azza wa knows best Duke says what happens if I don't read the Quran frequently when you come to halal or haram sins and good deeds if you don't read the Quran you're not sinful having said that if you don't read the Quran you will face trouble somewhere down the line why because your heart will be hardened and you will lose a lot of sins uh, you will lose a lot of good deeds and you won't be able to erase a lot of sins because the Quran is what energizes our hearts and it, it is what brings good life into our lives it's the barakah it's the blessing from Allah it is Allah's speech Allah's words so those who neglect it and choose other than it definitely are not on the straight path even if they're not sinful but they definitely will fall into sin eventually but to answer your question is he sinful or not no he's not yet he is in danger uh, um abdullah from saudi assalamu alaikum sheikh Shantullah. um my question is what is the right way to do ruqya from sihr or ain or hasad and we don't know who did it okay and my second question is my son is 12 years old 12 and a half um, is he rightfully from islam my mahram as in, um, as in i can travel with him alone and i can um, go for umrah or hajj with him where do you he live hmm? where do you live i live in five okay S any more questions no, thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Okay. Uh, Umar Abdullah had two questions. I think we have Hadi on the line. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Hayyak Allah. Uh, sir, I uh, had two questions. Yes. First question What is the particular age for a child of 12 years old uh, to means lead the, uh, lead the salah, means be the imam? Because in some cases, I have been facing like nobody used to come in front of me and people after the namaz used to, used to uh, after the salah used to judge me that why did you lead the salah. Okay. Second question. Yes. What is the ruling when a person cries while giving some fatwa or dawah on Islam? Why would he cry? Means, uh, means thinking about the Prophet and means the, means from his heart he is crying because after giving the fatwa about the Islam about Islam okay I will answer you inshallah okay we have a couple of questions from Abdullah and Hadi from Saudi Arabia but inshallah we will address these questions after the break so stay tuned Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that a man came to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O oh Messenger of Allah, poverty has struck me. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a messenger to one of his wives to bring something for that man to eat. But she said, by the one who sent you with the truth, I only have water. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent to another one of his wives to bring something for the man to eat. 
but she said the same until all of them said the same thing then Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said who will take this one as a guest in exchange for Allah's mercy a man from the Ansar said I will O messenger of Allah so he took the man to his home and said to his wife treat the guest of the messenger of Allah well she said by Allah we have nothing except the meal for my children he said get the food ready and light the lamp and put your children to sleep if they ask for dinner then when the guest enters dim the lamp and make it seem as if we are eating and when he reaches for the food to eat then stand up to the lantern and turn it off she got the food ready turned the lamp on and put the children to sleep she then went to the lamp as if she was fixing it and turned it off then they pretended as they were eating and they both went to sleep hungry in the morning the man from the Ansar went to Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said Allah has laughed implying his acceptance to the deed from your actions last night then Allah revealed his saying which means and they give them preference over themselves even though they were in need of that reported by al-Bukhari and Muslim Allah, la ilaha illallah. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Um Abdullah from Saudi Arabia, she says, How to do ruqya from evil eye, from envy, from black magic, from jinn possession? First of all, ruqya is a number of verses of the Quran hadiths of the Prophet والسلام, or supplications that we recite over a person who is in need of it whether he is possessed whether he has black magic we whether he has uh, evil eye and we try our level best to make him recover from such an illness and this can be recited to him directly as in this hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri may Allah be pleased with him in Bukhari and Muslim when they passed by a tribe of disbelievers and their leader was stung by a scorpion and he was dying so one of them came and recited Al-Fatiha chapter number one and after each time he recites it he blows on him dry spit which is like this there's no spit there's no moist coming so he kept on reciting it few times and all of a sudden the man was recovered and as nothing had happened to him so this is one means of doing it so what to recite recite Surah Al-Fatiha it's the best form of ruqya ever recite it seven times five times three times and frequently do it throughout the day and night you add to that Ayat al-Kursi, you add to that the last two ayahs of Surah al-Baqarah, you add to that the last three surahs of the Qur'an, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ And if it's, black, if it's magic or black magic, you may add the uh, selected verses from Surah Al-A'raf and Surah Yunus. وَلَا يُفْلِحُ السَّاحِرُ حَيْثُ أَتَى And the sorcerer would not would never be successful or succeed in what he's doing and you recite this and inshallah if you recite it over zamzam water and dry spit on it and make the patient drink from it a lot throughout the day and night and even if needed wash himself with it that would have a great and huge impact Shamim from Saudi Arabia Hayyak Allah Shamim Bay what can I do for you uh, Sheikh Asim, I just want to know, is there any hadith which says that we should not go to bed empty stomach? Uh, and we should eat something before going to sleep? Okay, any more questions? Thank you, sir. That is all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay. Uh, we have the second question of Um Abdullah. She says, 
that is my 12 and a half year old son um, legible to be my mahram to travel with and I asked her where she, she was and she said that she was in Taif going from Taif to Mecca does not need a mahram because it, it's so close it's less than 60 kilometers and you're there so we do not consider Taif commuting between Taif and Mecca to be uh, in need of a mahram so you can go with your son but traveling elsewhere you require a mahram and your son's age is a difference uh, uh, there is a difference of uh, uh, of opinion and views among scholars the majority say that he is required to be or to have reached the age of puberty and 12 and a half years of age there is a possibility that he had reached the age of puberty and the signs of uh, reaching the age of puberty are three one of them is sufficient one to reach the age of 15 which is not applicable here two to have nocturnal emission so wet dreams and this can be found out through his underwear when he wakes up and uh, you do the laundry so you can figure it out or by growing the hair over the pubic area the harsh hair which means that he has become a man if one of these signs were there then he is an adult he is a, a, a proper mahram for you to travel with and Allah knows best Abdullah from Saudi Abdullah Hello, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, I have one question. Yes, Akhi. Uh, I have a friend, he's a Muslim, and he don't do his prayer. So when I told him to do his prayer, his salat, he told me that, don't, don't you see that the ISIS what do in Iraq and Syria? And it, he began for, the, for this uh, story. So uh, tell me, how can I tell them, this person, or how can I make him to do his salat? Okay, any more questions? No, thank you. Jazakallah. Well, Jazak. Okay. Uh, Hadi's question. Oh, okay. I got it all mixed up. No. Hadi's first question is that he prays and he leads the prayer and he's 12 years old. And whenever he finishes the prayer, he gets people scorning him and scolding him for praying why do you lead the prayer and you're young so he's asking what, what should I do Hadi don't look at these people if there's no one fit to lead the prayer except you and you're not the one who races to lead the prayer but they tell you come and pray and lead us don't even bother responding to these uh, cries and especially when it comes from these elders we have a problem in our masjids that those who are elders in the masjid and I'm afraid I'm talking about myself as well I'm not that young they tend to make a scene out of everything they don't have the knowledge they don't have the etiquette and you so often see them in the masjid sometimes fighting with one another or fighting with passers-by just raising their voices as if they are sitting in their own living room and this is totally prohibited the Prophet ﷺ once looked at his companions and said to them do not raise your voices in the masjid so those who are you know coming and uh, just complaining and criticizing and shouting and doing this and that it's part of their age probably part of their upbringing don't pay attention what's the ruling on a kid of 12 years old leading the prayer the majority of scholars say that it is not permissible in fard prayer so the Malikiya, the Ahnaf and the Hanabila say that it should not be done in fard Shafi'iya and Hassan al-Basri, Ishaq ibn Rahoya and other great scholars say no this is totally permissible the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam that the person who memorizes the most of Quran should lead the prayer 
the hadith in Bukhari Muslim of Amr ibn Salama, may Allah be pleased with him, that he said, I came with my people and we accepted Islam. And as we were going back, the Prophet said, let the most of you who memorizes Quran lead you in prayer. So they looked around and they found me to be the most person memorizing the Quran. And I was seven years of age. So they let me be their imam. And this was under the supervision of the Prophet So يعني, avoid getting into arguments with such people and this would be inshallah better for you and you're not doing anything wrong. We have a caller from Pakistan. Yes, Assalamu alaikum Shaykh. Alaikum salam. Your name is? My name is Hassan. 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 Yes, Hassan. Yes. Okay. Uh, my question is that my family, uh, we have reason to believe that my family is under a spell of black magic. Okay. So we are doing the rupiah uh, as prescribed by you uh, regularly. There is some improvement. I, what I wanted to know was that we are planning to go for Umrah in a couple of days. Would this help us uh, further? Would this be a good thing to do? Uh, I mean, obviously Umrah is good, but would this help us directly Hassan. as far as... Uh, Hassan, uh, who, who, who is affect, afflicted by this uh, black magic? Uh, my wife, uh, my wife primarily, and also my son and myself a little bit. Is this the, you know, I mean, uh, three of us all to, uh, together, I would say. Okay. But my wife is the most affected by this. Okay. Uh, any more questions, Hassan? Oh, that's it. I will answer you, inshallah. Nayaz from Saudi? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam, akhi. How are you, Sheikh? I'm fine, Zakallah khair, for asking. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, if Salatul Janaza, if a person uh, dies elsewhere in the home country, so okay. people, can they offer for the relative or anyone who is living here, they ask in the, like somewhere in the office and they, are, they want to join and make a Salatul Janaza. Okay. Is this... Uh, Any more questions? No, Jazak. I will answer you, inshallah. Akhi. Hadi uh, had a second question. And he said that sometimes we watch a fatwa or a lecture and the scholar giving the fatwa or the lecture starts to weep and cry out of his love to the Prophet out of remembering something that is related to the sunnah or to the deen out of his fear of Allah. So what's the ruling on that? This is something you cannot control. There are incidents that sometimes you, without you feeling it, sometimes you may be reading a story of the seerah in, the, in your own home and nobody's with you. And all of a sudden, it talks about how the Prophet ﷺ heart trembled when he saw mother, uh, our mother Khadija's necklace that was given to his daughter Zainab and she was paying it as a ransom for her husband Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'i and the Prophet ﷺ, when he saw it he remembered Khadija so sometimes you don't you can't control yourself but feel emotional so if a person does this out of his love and not intentionally this is something in Allah's hands but if someone is faking it Unfortunately, there are people who may fake such things and they want by this to draw attention of the people and get their praise for them. Definitely, this is a form of hypocrisy. But who on earth is capable of determining whether this is sincere or showing off and a form of hypocrisy? Only Allah. We do not judge people. So if we see something like this, alhamdulillah, we ask Allah to soften our hearts and to give us such fear and love, fear from him and love to his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shamim says, is there any hadith recommending or a, a, a forbidden, forbidding a person from going to bad empty stomach on an empty stomach? No, there isn't anything like that. You want to go on an empty stomach, that's good for you. It might be healthier to stop eating after 6 o'clock p.m., as they say. This is good for the heart, it's good for, but, but who cares? And if you want to go on a full stomach, this is up to you totally. There's nothing Islamically pro or against. Abdullah from Saudi Arabia, he has a friend, and whenever 
this so-called Muslim, whenever he asks him to come to pray with him, the man fires away in his face. And he says that what good is Islam? Look what Daesh, what ISIS, the non-Islamic state, uh, uh, is doing, these terrorists are doing. Your friend is in great danger. If he's attributing the terrorist attacks to Islam, then he's not a Muslim. If he's accusing Islam, if he is accusing um, uh, Quran and Sunnah and trying to tarnish the reputation of Islam by saying that these terrorist attacks were a result of Islam, he's not a Muslim. And it is unfortunate for a Muslim to speak like this. It was, it is indeed praiseworthy what President Erdogan of Turkey said to uh, um, uh, the Councillor Merkel of Germany when she said that this is Islamic terrorism. Every Muslim ruler should say that this. We do not have anything to relate Islam to terrorism. This is unacceptable. And whoever uses such a terminology, there's something wrong in their Islam. If you're willing to say and accuse terrorism of being Islamic, then you have something wrong in your Islam, and Allah knows best. Uh, we have a caller from Tunisia. I cannot see the name. Kamal. Kamal, yes, Kamal. Hi, yes, Salam alaikum. Salam to Allah. I have, uh, you know, um, my mother, my mother, she, uh, she's, uh, you know, she, I want to, stu I want to study Quran, okay. but she wants me to work. Okay. And, and I don't know, you know, what if I do, I disobey her and uh, work or uh, study Quran and uh, I work, what's uh, the best? Okay. But I know uh, all is uh, Quran, uh, studying Quran is uh, best, you know, but because it uh, takes the whole year, you know, to uh, come every day. And, uh, okay, I, I get your question, Kamal. Any more, any more questions? Uh, no, sir. Thank you. I will answer you. Aisha Krabbi. Hassan from Pakistan says that his family, wife, child, and himself, are afflicted by sihr, by black magic. And they've tried ruqya, and it's not mm, working that good. And they're coming over for umrah, inshallah. So would it help? First of all, my answer. First of all, Akhi, do not blame black magic for your failure people around us all of us if my child fails in high school I would blame evil eye if my wife is nagging and causing problems I would say that she is possessed by jinn if I don't get a raise or if someone sacks me from my job I would say that this is black magic and if my tire gets flat, I say this is envy. So I tend to blame all of my shortcomings and what's happening to me, my failures, over these things because they are uh, uh, supernatural and I cannot see them. And this is wrong. Do you mean, Sheikh, that these things do not exist? No. On the contrary, they do exist. But it, to my conviction, 5% of all the cases around exist and 95 are simply illusions and superstitions and don't have any reality or relationship nevertheless let's assume that there is something if you're coming to umrah you're coming to perform a ritual if you perform umrah knowing that only allah can cure you and your family only allah can uh, 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 protect you from any evils or any harm. Only Allah can restore your health and wealth back again. If you come with this conviction, you do your Umrah, you finish your Umrah, you cut your hair or shave it, and also your children, and then you come back to the Kaaba, and you pray two rak'ahs, and then you raise your hand after finishing your two rak'ahs, praise Allah, 
offer salutation to the Prophet ﷺ, and then ask Allah wholeheartedly, Oh Allah, this is your house. This is the most sacred spot on earth, if not on, in, 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 in anywhere else. And I am here coming to you in humility, expressing my poverty and my submissiveness. No one can help me. You have so many servants other than me, but I have only one Lord, and that is you. Oh Allah, cure me, cure my wife, cure my child, and keep on insisting with the conviction with certainty in your mind that you will be cured, that you will not leave al haram except with all your illnesses are gone and had, have uh, uh, disappeared. You have to go with this attitude, believing that Allah Azza wa will not return you empty-handed. And keep on doing this for half an hour, for an hour, for as long as it takes. And inshallah, and I'm confident, that you will be cured with the grace of Allah. Abdullah from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Allah. Uh, Sheikh, um, I have two questions. Yes. Okay, I have heard some people after the Adhan say La ilaha illallah and they continue Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in, uh, in the, in the um, Tajweed way. Uh, in the microphone or on their own? Hello? Yes, yeah, yeah, Abdullah. Do they do it on their own or in yes. the microphone? No, on the microphone and the adhan is muhad. Only one adhan in the whole country. Okay. And my second question is... Um, yes. My mom and my dad are divorced and my father uh, doesn't pay anything for me, my nafaka, and my mom takes care of all my needs in school and etc. I don't like to go to my father. He said he, he will only give me something when I go and live with him. What should I do? Okay. Any more question? No, thank you, sir. This is unfortunate, but uh, let's get to the rest. Niaz from Saudi Arabia, he says, can we offer funeral prayer over someone who died overseas? The answer is no. I'm here in Saudi Arabia, my relative dies in Pakistan. We say, let us um, uh, pray funeral for him as he's not here. This is not permissible. Because then we will perform like 10 uh, funeral prayer after every salat. Because so many people are around and so many people die. However, it is in some schools of thought permissible to offer a prayer over someone who is not present if he died in a country where no Muslims could offer such a prayer. As in the case of the Najashi, the ruler of Abyssinia, when he died, the Prophet ﷺ offered prayer in Medina because he had no Muslims to pray funeral prayer for him in Abyssinia. Or if someone of, uh, uh, who, was, who is a dignitary of the Muslims, yani a great scholar of Islam or a great ruler, if he can be found, in, of Islam and he dies so out of grief the Muslims honor this scholar or this great uh, ruler by offering prayer and this is one of the schools of thought I do not recommend this as it seems that this is not to be done except to someone who Muslims did not pray uh, uh, for and this is why when the companions died in Mecca or died elsewhere the Prophet ﷺ would not pray funeral prayer for them, and Allah knows best. Kamal from Tunis says that his mother wants him to work and he wants to dedicate a whole year to learning Quran. What should he do? This depends. If you're rich or you come from a very rich family and you can afford to quit school or work for a year, no, definitely learning Islam is better for you. But if you are struggling and your family is struggling and they need someone to uh, uh, earn for them in this case no work get food on the table dedicate instead of eight hours a day for quran dedicate half an hour to an hour and this you would have this balance inshallah azza wa jal uh, abdullah from saudi arabia says that in his country there is one adhan 
So they put a recorder, and all of the, uh, the speaker phones were, uh, in the country follows this adhan. This is not permissible. If the adhan is being called by a person, and there are different messages connected to my microphone, but I am a human being calling the adhan on time in different areas and messages of the city where I live, this is okay. But to have a recording as is done, no, this is totally unaccepted and it's not permissible. And he says, after the adhan, the mu'adhan says, la ila, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu Muhammad rasulullah. So the adhan is concluded by la ilaha illallah. This is what the adhan is over. So he adds afterwards the shahada or some recite the Quran or some, this is totally uh, prohibited and it's an innovation. His second question or last question that his parents are divorced and his mother takes care of all the expenses and his father does not pay a, a penny and his father insists that he moves in with him in order to give him money. Your father is sinful and he is accountable to Allah Azza wa Jal and most likely he will be punished by Allah for not giving you your uh, uh, provision and your allowance. It is his responsibility, whether you are living with your mom or with your grandparents, it is his responsibility to take care of your food, your clothes, your education, your medical bills, etc. And your mom can take him to court and can demand this through court that he pays this uh, uh, by force. And uh, uh, by doing this, she is not transgressing. He is transgressing by not paying you what you need. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. And with this, we come to the conclusion of tonight's episode. Until we meet next week, same time, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Is for Allah, nothing but Allah. Ba is the beginning of Bismillah. Ta is for taqwa, bewaring of Allah. And tha is for thawab, a reward. Ja is for Jannah, the garden of paradise. Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage. Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood given to the Prophet. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam